So um, today, um, I, as the host of the DevOps Radio podcast, which if you haven't heard it before, self-promoting plug, please go download it. If you have, tell a friend. We've decided to conduct DevOps Radio Live here at CloudBeast Connect, and we have um, a panel of real-world practitioners and leaders that are going to participate with us. Unfortunately, Aswini, the lead CI automation engineer at AIB, is not able to join us. We may get her on later. But we do have Sanmat Zanjari, lead DevOps engineer at Nationwide Building Society. Hello, Sanmat. How are you doing um, today? Yeah, not so bad. Thank you. How are you? Uh, good, doing good, doing good. Thank you for joining us. Heck of a background, heck of a background. Um, it, it reminds me of the cogs we had on our earlier screen and people working together. Um, next, we have Jimmy's colleagues, Aoife Fitzmaurice, architect for enterprise cloud computing at Fidelity. And it looks like Jimmy's been giving you a lot of plugs with Cloud First and Cloud Native. How are you doing, Aoife? Doing good, doing good. Jimmy's a hard act to follow. <laughs> Great. I'm sure I'm sure you'll kick his butt. Don't worry. No, <laughs> just joking. Uh, and then, of course, you guys have already met Jimmy McNamara, software engineering product manager at Fidelity, um, a colleague of IFA's. And I'm just joking, Jimmy. Thank you. It was a great job in the keynote. So at this point, why don't we go ahead and remove the slide and jump right into our panel topics. So, um, you know, in, in planning for this, uh, we identified a list of high level topics that we wanted to cover as a team. And as soon as I can locate the screen while I have those topics, um, we, will, we will jump in on, uh, I've seemed to have lost it in one of my uh, 15 different sets of tabs I have going on. Now, here we go. So I'd first like to start with the topic of defining DevOps in the enterprise. I know we go to conferences like this. We always talk about kind of the happy path to DevOps, what the ideal is. Um, but I'm wondering, and I'd like to discuss, are there differences in the challenges and the benefits of DevOps in the enterprise? And I'd like to start by going to Sanmat. Sanmat, Nationwide Building Society operates at an enormous scale. So I particularly want to start with asking you, what's your definition of enterprise DevOps? Uh, um, from the nationwide perspective, what we say is you build it, you run it. So, and we proved in last year, we rolled out at last in suite and literally in eight, eight to 10 weeks, right from purchasing the software through to delivery to the first team onboarding, we did in eight to 10 weeks. And now the team still builds it and continue to evolve it and run it. And it's at, at the moment, it's about 5,000 users plus in less than a year. We also believe in uh, building process dependent environment, not the person dependent. And uh, I think, and one of the biggest impediment in implementing enterprise DevOps, we think is thinking and working in silos. Yes, it gives accountable freedom, but it comes up with the increased overall organization cost. And it may also lead to the inconsistent um, engineering practices. So we, from the DevOps enablement engineering team, what we do is we, we, are, we, we enable and run the shared services and implement DevOps practices for every scores or the target team. The way we adopt or the way we work with uh, the team is we engage with them. We understand uh, their flow of work. Value stream analysis is a key thing also and understand what the current pain points are, how they wanna see the target then we work with them to achieve their target, defining the MVP. We also shadow them and they shadow us to make sure they are confident to build and run their own system, which we help them yeah. to build it at the beginning. It also gives them a confidence that they are building their own capability within the score so they can build and run it and also mobilize them very quickly. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. And I'd, I'd then like to Aoife... Take it over to you and understand how is your experience at Fidelity, in particularly with the cloud, um, like or different from what Samat just described? Yeah, it's kind of interesting, right? And I don't know about you, Samat, but it's more kind of um, a culture shift versus anything else, really. It's 
it's a huge kind of change in mindset in terms of like traditional kind of setups where you had, you know, siloed approaches to your developer, your QA, your testing, and then into your kind of operations kind of space. So, Mm -hmm. you know, it's kind of interesting when with Fidelity because you have different teams that you're operating against and there's different maturities that exist. So some teams are very mature and they are doing the DevOps practices. So you build it, you own it, all the same things that you're talking about, Samad. But then, Mm you've got other teams that are just not there. So they may be more traditional. They're dealing with institutional applications. They have a lot of audit. They have a lot of compliance. They have a lot of restrictions in that space. So then how do they kind of transform? They want to transform, but then how do they transform with those limitations? So it's kind of interesting to be able to operate against both of those types of teams, you know, and then help them in that journey to the, uh, yeah. the DevOps framework. So, and Jimmy is actually, he's, he's quite good because uh, in our kind of offices, obviously with COVID and everything, nobody's in the offices anymore, but Jimmy is throwing up all of these kind of posters around for our kind of teams. And it's like, you build it, you own it, you architect, you own it. And yeah. all of these types of kind of, you know, mottos are kind mm-hmm. of, pasted around the place so you know from our perspective we're truly a devops team awesome thank you Aoife so uh, you know just to emphasize that you guys really had to start with especially in terms of your complexity and as we said your hybrid portfolio with with building the culture or unifying a culture across that portfolio to move forward 100% it doesn't you can't progress without that culture and you need to have that drive to actually and it can't be centrally and artificially kind of owned you know it needs to be at the team level itself and they need to have the control to be able to make those changes obviously there's you know other kind of fundamental things that they need to work within but you know within those kind of constraints allowing them to be able to kind of make that transformation and applying that culture into their teams is key okay excellent Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to go ahead and move forward um, in the interest of time um, to our next topic. And this is about balancing security, compliance, and quality with speed. So especially um, in financial institutions, right? How important is it that you maintain or implement governance measures while you build this culture and this movement to modernize? Um, Aoife, I'm going to go back to you. How do you balance these elements? What's most important? I know we should just leave, shouldn't we? We should join like gaming kind of industry or something <laughs> like that. You know, get rid of all these restrictions and audit and compliance and SOC and all of these types of things and, you know, get on to more exciting stuff. But unfortunately for us, you know, banking institutions, that you you can't get away from it. It's your bread and butter. It's it's not a choice. It's um it's fundamental to how you kind of operate and how you do your CICD. So regardless of you know how far you are in your journey, you must kind of incorporate these principles in terms of security, audit, compliance, quality, all of these kind of things. So I think Jimmy kind of referred to it a couple of times in terms of like some of our models in enterprise cloud computing and it's passed to the cloud in a safe, secure manner. That's all it is. It's not a, a question of, you know, if there will be a breach, we know potentially there'll be a breach down the line. It's going to be a matter of when and when that breach does happen, have we done everything within our control to ensure that that is not our fault, that we've secured all of our systems, that we've ensured that the quality of the code is good, that we're doing good SCLC against the actual applications themselves. So there's kind of a a couple of layers probably within that, but I'd be interested to hear you, Samas, and kind of what you're kind of doing in your space. But um, from our perspective, there's probably kind of two things. You know, part of it is the ownership of the developers themselves to feel like they must be in control and understand the, the reasons for having good quality code and to going through those security checks to ensure that that code itself that they're developing, pushing out is, is of a standard. And then from a central perspective, you know, there are things around compliance of tagging and, and so on and so forth that we can monitor and make sure that some of the practices that we have um, set out. So things like you must um, redeploy your application every X number of days, your base images, etc., can only be X yeah. number of days old, things like yeah. that, you know, practical things that you kind of have laid out in terms of your policies that we do enforcement against that. So we have things like you can't do your promotion to release if your images are 
you know, X number of days old, you therefore can't deploy that image, you know, and, you know, if you have deployed an image and it's X number of days old, you know, we have controls in place then that basically alert out to say that your, your uh, deployments are too old, you need to redeploy your application. So there's a lot of kind of, you know, the back and forth between the two things, you know, how do you enable fast deployments, but still you, you have to do it in a safe, secure way. Yeah, that's, that's a really good point about, I think, the shifting left is that always you must have, heard, everyone must have heard about shift left, everything should be a developer end. So the way I think we, uh, from the nationwide perspective, are there any financial uh, in industries is the, all these are, elements are equally important. And, mm -hmm. and you wouldn't be able to release the code into production if the code is insecure. At the same time, if in securing the code take you so long, that it's too late to deliver in the market that you are out of market. So you, you can't get the benefit of it. So, and I must admit here, the uh, I, I have to name the Cloud Beast Jenkins helping a lot here and nationwide is we we are creating templates and uh, for the team, those have never seen CI. So that templates give them the confidence that within the pipeline, they have everything baked in that the security, compliance, yeah. approvals, quality checks. Mm. So that gives developer confidence that if I'm releasing a code into production, I'm safe, I'm secure, and I have a full degree of confidence. So there will not be any delays in getting the approval because you know the financial organization cab approval is, is a tricky. So if you have followed these practices, which are baked in within the templates, you don't need to worry about it. And uh, that, that's really a great feature from the Cloud Beach Jenkins. At the same time, is we, um, we, again, you mentioned quite right that we have degree of um, variance in our teams. Like we are 100% cloud native application when we have mainframe and Unis is a legacy application. So, and when we work with those team, we understand that they are still starting the, their journey in DevOps area. So we, we give them from CI CDA to start with the basics, right? So to get the automation in place first, then right. go into build it and run it mode. So it's, 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 I think it's, everything is, is quite important in various phases of the entire software development lifecycle. Awesome yeah. answer, awesome answer. Uh, did you have a comment, Aoife or Jimmy? No, uh, it's, the correlations are huge, right? And you know, previously there would have been a lot of kind of like, let, let the developer kind of you know, do what they want to do, you know, let them have the freedom mm. of that choice. But I think we're kind of coming around you know, just in terms of how things have been uh, apply culturally and it's more kind of like the developers just want to be able to push out the code so give us those standard templates and pipelines that we can leverage so that we can just pump this stuff out I don't want to have to worry about having to do you know Sonicube or Vericode or whatever else that's there just right. you know plug in all the bits and pieces that I need to do and just let me get at it yeah I think if you create you know um there's always going to be a natural tension between the various areas in terms of what outcome want. The developer wants to get that as fast as possible, the business does. And then you've got your security and governance also having a natural tension. As long as you create platforms where you can have open discussions and everyone understands, you know, what's going on, what risks are available or what risks are there, that you know, then then you can put the controls in place so that you can you can enable that um, fluid movement of <coughs> of features from left to right, right, and and everybody everybody wants. To help support the business right? right it's all in everyone's interest so it's just it's it's about creating good forums and good communications and dialogue between the folks to enable that yeah it's a very interesting statement that you make there uh jimmy it came up a bit in our discussion and the keynote and discussions i've had before is um you know generally if you hire the right people they do their work with good intentions and uh, they'll be fully on board with standardization and governance and in fact will help implement that in a smart and intelligent way, provided that they're, that they're given context, right? And they're read in and there's a bi-directional discussion. Mm -hmm. um, now, this actually, you guys set me up well, I'm gonna hire you guys, uh, hire y'all on, on DevOps Radio because you know, this shifts us to shared ownership and empowering the practitioner. Um, you know, people talk about happy developers or productive developers, productive developers stay. And I'd extend that to say practitioners, whether DevOps engineers, operations engineers, or, or development teams. Um, and you talked a lot about culture, Jimmy. Um, how does shared ownership and empowerment 
enable faster adoption of these practices at scale. And I think specifically for you, Jimmy, how have you balanced standardization and autonomy to uh, provide for empowerment of developers? Yeah, I mean, it's like gearing, like the analogy, right? So if you've got common needs, right, um, and, and, and you know, that then makes sense to take those needs and, and uh, make them available centrally because uh, as long as they're common across the organization, then that means that the folks who are looking to develop software don't need to redo stuff, right? They can just take it up, do it once, right? It's a, it's a gearing effect, right? So that um, if you're enabling at the center and if you're making um, features and, and capabilities available that are, are, are commonly needed across um, the organization and as long as you provide that service to a really really high level then then that's value so when people and yeah. developers see value uh, then that's not a problem especially when you're really smart developers because they realize that that's actually going to help them right so when yeah. you're helping people that's always good so i yeah. think that's it's the balance and it's it's not trying to be overly um, prescriptive or constraining it's about having a good dialogue having a good communication and say hey you guys you're doing this and actually there's lots of different businesses in our company doing this you know we, we that makes sense to kind of centrally harvest that back right and you know part of a central group is to um, a identify that b help facilitate communication across the various, various business units so that the, they they understand that, and then then it becomes well, you know, actually, yeah, that you guys take that one because that makes sense, um, because that then means that we can all focus on, you know, what we need to do in right. our various right. business areas, right. and actually, when you harvest back to the center, then you can get lots of different point of views and and actually harvest back the best practice as well, right, for that whatever you're dealing with, so that um, you know you're getting. You know, you're you're in some ways you're almost like a central little consultancy. You know, you, you got visibility across all areas, all, all the PUs, and then you harvest back what makes sense, and you harvest back the practice with it, so that then okay. yeah. the rest can focus on on, on generating business software. I, I love that term. I hadn't really heard it. Harvest back to the center, mm -hmm. and uh, I think that is a really interesting. Um, answer to how do you empower people but then scale or leverage that empowerment to scale. Um, Sam Mott, um, how are you encouraging collaboration and adoption and, you know, at the same time, empowering developers and teams to use the tools they want? Yeah, the tools, I think, I think it's a hot topic almost in every organization, I believe. And overly crowded DevOps tools. Uh, if you go in an organization, there are hundreds of 50 or tools there always. The nationwide believes in empowering people and, and, and creating an environment where you have the accountable freedom. And, and that's one of the key pillars of nationwide leadership framework. So the way I look at it is that like developers have, you know, the, they, they constantly look for the new library, specifically in this open source world and experimenting new tools, technologies. So we think why shouldn't be the same approach for DevOps tools? It is important to understand why team choosing to to it for their own tool sets, why they want to do that. There could be there could be a gap in the enterprise tooling capabilities out there, or there may be a better way which the team may have devised that to deliver something, or there may be an out of date um, tooling strategy that may that organization may have. So I think nowadays it's quite important to reassess the tooling strategy in every nine to twelve months, and and the way we are dealing in the nationwide is 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 to to have the clear exit strategy from the tool and developing the adaptive pipelines uh, so that I can plug and play any tools, like if, if any tool for security scans. So you can turn one, one, one uh, tool off, turn it on another one, it's just endpoint change. So creating that flexibility in the pipeline helps to quickly migrate from one tool to the other tool because it's, it's quite important nowadays. And when we're moving into cloud world as well, things are getting in push model rather than pull model. So everything just, you get the release. You don't, you don't have a choice. You have to uplift your technology, you have to uplift your code in order to cope up with those uh, dynamic changes happening. We also have the lean tooling governance board just to, it's, it's, uh -huh. the idea is not to command and control, is to, to come up and talk about it so that 
the rest of the community and nationwide understand that there is a new capability coming out there why don't we try it out and why don't we why don't we uplift our current pipeline to to cater to the latest uh, latest development needs and also to to assess whether the particular capability is fit for use fit for purpose is we don't want over no one wants overcrowded tools because it's going to cost a lot for organization right. paying for same capability paying to two different vendors as an example so and also we say the team teams please and they remember devops is a culture not the tools right 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 unless it's a cloud beast tool of course no um just joking um, um so i'm i'm kind of scared i'm going to go over to ifa i'm worried that jimmy ifa sam matt you guys are going to take my devops radio job um, with the way that you guys are handling his answers but i'll risk it um Aoife, do you have any comment on this? Do you have your own perspective on how you see practitioners being empowered at Fidelity? Yeah, it's kind of a, an interesting dichotomy that we kind of have to deal with. So, I mean, within our company, it's we're many companies in a single company. So that's right. you, you're kind of dealing with all of these um different business units as we call them and they they have an equal voice you know so how do you kind of get that consistency across those business units to then say okay our role is to provide that central stack for you you are our you know we are your provider you are our customer so we want to do the best thing for these business units themselves so trying to get the business units to work together to come up with that common stack that meets the needs of the developers overall because after all, if you kind of take it above the developer, the needs are common across the kind of stack itself. So you don't want to have so much diversity that you're just carrying a lot of weight as you kind of right. evolve these tools as well, which is key because it's not necessarily that, you know, even in the copies world, right? You know, five, six years ago, it was all configuration based, then it went into templates and now it's pipeline as code. So you yeah. want to be able to evolve within the stack and also kind of make sure that you plug any holes across the stack and make sure then that it, that's viable across all of the business units that are there. So, you know, it's kind of interesting. We had like a situation, you know, over the last year or so where it was more of a dictate and, you know, some choices were kind of made that essentially were pushed onto the business units and you know we spent a year of like you know back and forth at loggerheads for this so then you know we learned from that you know we, we don't always get it right and we just kind of took a step back and said okay let's make this a you know a consensus let's work together towards the next thing if this choice was not correct let's get the right choice let's work together to make that choice and as soon as we kind of change that conversation, it becomes less about stop restraining me, allow me to be an individual, allow me to do my own thing. And it was more ar around like, well, I don't want to make that choice for just myself. You know, I want you to own it and I want, you know, the rest of the kind of business units to use it. So how can we do that? So all the things yeah. you talked about, Sam, about try scan scale, all of that stuff we do ourselves as well. It's it's great stuff. It's complex area. It's so huge, you know. That's a phenomenal, phenomenal answer. Um, I, heard, I hear a little bit of what's often said, the adage, move slow so you can move fast. And I think sometimes it's important to take the time to build the dialogue, as you said, Jimmy, um, to try to establish consensus that results in people taking on shared ownership and feeling empowered at the same time. And that may take time to do. I think it's not easy, right? But if you invest up front, you're going to reap returns faster, longer, better later. Um, so now's a great time, actually, <coughs> Aoife, your question, um, I mean, your, your answer leads me to a question coming from chat um, that I'll first direct to you, and uh, then maybe, Sam, you may want to follow up. And this is, how do you draw this borderline between DevOps and developers' responsibilities? Or is there even a line to be drawn? And uh, Aoife, why don't we start with you, and then we can go to Sam Mott. Yeah, <laughs> there kind of isn't really a line to be drawn. It's it's so blurry. So, I mean, if I kind of draw on what we provide, we have um, 
So we have the platforms themselves. We provide some of the services on top of these platforms so you can integrate natively with, you know, things like, you know, your quality scanning tool, your security scanning tools and things like that. And then on top of that, you know, we kind of work with the business unit centrally to define what templates and standards they want to push against their business unit themselves. So across the business units, that will vary, but we want to enable that out of the box. So things like some of the feature functionalities that you can do in terms of Cloudbase, for example, with all the templates and, you know, creating pipelines from those templates, you want to hook those in because those are essentially supported. Um, and then, you know, if you kind of get beyond that layer, then it's almost like, okay, if, if you are such a snowflake, if you're so special, then, you know, allow them to kind of do that, allow them to go off on their own, you know, so they can support their own kind of journey in that space and just let them go forward with that. And those are usually kind of like lab type work, innovation, things like that. And then they come back to the kind of central kind of forum to kind of actually productionalize this and bring this forward. And therefore they want to conform to their business unit standards and then to start to leverage the enterprise tools themselves to be able to do that. So it's never a clear line. It's always quite blurry, but you know, you know, it's always for the common good of just getting, you know, your features out as fast as possible. And if there's any kind of gaps or any slowdowns within that process, then we work to kind of like reduce that down and make the right choices to kind of make sure that you can go at speed. Absolutely, I think, yeah, I think we follow the same. I think the way we look at it is if you draw, even a, thinking about drawing a line, then that means you're creating silos. Yeah. So we you don't want. So we so as I explained earlier, we the way we do is we engage with developers, we engage with the team. What are the objectives? How we want to de de design your pipeline? Yes, there are there are guardrails. If you are if you are joining a party, you need to follow the rules, right? So this is a good as is playing a game, right? So there are certain guardrails which are obviously defined to make sure service is protected. And in the interest of the developer, obviously in the interest of delivering the code securely, safely, and at the speed in the production line. What we also encourage is, is especially talking about the pipeline template, just an example. So we, we create MVP, we create a baseline product, and then we encourage developers to collaborate so that we create an open source community within nationwide itself. So that can be conceived, templates have been defined that can be consumed by the other squads because normally we've seen in the past that everyone is doing their own bit. Even if I have to do a versioning of a library, everyone have its own code. Wherein we know we in as an enterprise, the versioning concept is same, but everyone writing the same code. So what we do is we create those templates, global libraries, and help developers to, 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 to contribute there, collaborate there so that it, it, every other team can also take the benefit about it. So that's that's uh, that's kind of our approach Excellent. to to encourage them to work with us to help them help them basically. Awesome, thank you, thank you. So we'll move into our last question. We have a few, so I'm going to munch a couple of together for you, Jimmy. Um, and at the root of this is um, getting management support or overcoming C-suite resistance. So can you explain if you've ever run into resistance in bringing man getting management to support your DevOps initiatives? Um, and, and if so, how would you um, convince them to support this? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, we've been lucky. You know, our leadership has been pretty, very, very supportive, right? Through cloud, through DevOps. But, you know, like anything else, right? If you demonstrate value to anybody, right? And present that value and that value you know, for us, it's about using our own stuff, right, and showing that that's improved what we've done, and then using data t to um, show the outcomes. So, if you have any executives sitting in any organization, and you're presenting to them something that they could potentially leverage themselves to improve their own organization, and, you know, meet their own goals, right, um, yeah, most, if not all people, are going to be very supportive of that. So it's about uh, articulating um, a vision, a value, um, and then ideally demonstrating that in a very tangible way with the associated data. So that basically what you're saying is, well, you know, we think this is good, we think this is value here, and here is it done, and actually, you, you know, you can use it in your organization, and it's going to it's going to improve these areas. So I think it's about, A, ensuring that it's a value-based discussion, back it up with data, and ideally show it done. 
Awesome. Awesome. And I, you know, I would add to that a bit of opinion and lesson that also came from another panel we did is, um, it sounds like I heard uh, 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 both a bottoms up and top down approach. So it sounds like, look, if, if you got to just get moving, get moving, prove some of the benefits, and then work with management to get support. So um, everybody, I think we're at about time, we got to move to uh, getting some of our attendees some prizes and then getting them into some uh, very valuable workshops. Um, before we wrap though, I want to go around and see if anybody has any final words. Um, we'll go ahead and start with our right. Um, Jimmy, do you have any final words for our audience? No, I, I, yeah, I mean, for me, I think it's an extremely exciting time in IT. I think it's, um, you know, it's, a, it, it's um, a very creative age. There's a huge amount of um, um, there's a huge amount of new feature functions available. A huge amount of um, creativity in terms of creating new, and it's just um, you know it's it's really exciting time, and, and it's great to be involved in a in an area where we can kind of facilitate the uh, creativity and leverage the the type of um, new technologies and new platforms the industry is, is pushing out. So. You know, it's, it's a awesome. great industry to work in at the moment. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for sharing your experiences. I think it makes it even better. Um, Sam Matt, over to you. Do you have any final words? Yeah, I think um, in this, uh, again, rapidly changing uh, the technologies, uh, don't over rely on tools. DevOps is culture, not the tools. And also build it, run it. That will bring a lot of value. And also the environment will be much more interesting to work in. Awesome. Thank you. And Aoife, over to you. Any final words? Yeah, I, I just find these kind of connects kind of heartening because it really just confirms as you kind of talk to other people, the voices in the industry that, you know, you're on the right path. You know, there's a lot of correlation between us, you know, the things that we're doing somewhat slightly different, but the, the main kind of building blocks are the same, which is great. And it just means that, you know, our outcomes are just going to be that much more successful, which is huge. Agreed 100%. I love these discussions. I love hearing, learning, sharing. And to that end, I want to thank uh, all three of you and Aswini who didn't get to join us for the time that you've taken to be here today, the time that you've invested preparing for today, but not only that, the time you've spent trying to move things forward, learning, and then sharing that experience here with the audience at CB Connect. Again, thank you very much. If you can and you have the opportunity, please jump over into uh, chat or over into Slack and we will be there um, answering questions and maybe we'll be lucky enough to be joined by our all-star audience. Thank you, Aoife. Thank you, Samma. Thank you, Jimmy. Over to you, Jimmy. Thank you, Brian. All right. Thank you. Thanks again, Brian, Aoife, Sanmat, and Jimmy. Uh, and in a couple of minutes, folks, uh, the conversation will continue in the, um, in the session chat and possibly some um, questions may pop up in our CloudBees Connect Slack workspace. But before you all head on over there, it is raffle prize time. So we would love to thank CompuWare and Now Secure for their participation in the raffle prizes. And so we're gonna be raffling off um, a Xbox One S um, uh, game console from CloudBees, from CompuWare. They're gonna be raffling off a really cool Bose um, wireless uh, headphone set. And now Secure is going to be raffling off a $100 Amazon gift card and a $100 donation to a charity of your choice. So I'm going to hand it over to Max as he is going to announce the winners. Take it away, Max. Thanks, Jude. So I'll be posting these names in the Slack very soon. But for right now, I want to to announce it before I do that. So going from top to bottom, the winner of the Xbox, we have a Mark Bauman. I'm sorry in advance if I say any of your names wrong. The Beats, the winner is Ignacy Fosh. And for the gift card, we have a Suman Nandy. So congrats to our winners. 
the uh, the sponsors will be reaching out to you shortly to get your information. Excellent. Thank you very much, Max. And congratulations to all of the winners. So now, folks, it is time to check out some awesome sponsor demos. You will be staying in the session, um, the auditorium. You can check out the sponsor demos from there. And then if uh, you have some time, please head on over to our sponsor, Expo Hall A and B. Uh, make sure you come back into the auditorium to continue on with the workshops that'll kick off at one o'clock CEST. So thanks again to our sponsors and we look forward to hearing from all of you in our CloudBees Connect Slack workspace with all the activity that's going on. And then please come on back into the auditorium to kick off the workshops at one o'clock CEST. So once again, stay connected with Slack. That's where all of the live Q&A is gonna take place for all of the workshop activities. Um, if you do jump into the CloudBees workshop sessions, please make sure you um, click on that link. It's gonna take you into the Zoom breakout for those particular sessions. All of the other workshops will remain in the auditorium. Thank you all so much. Enjoy the rest of the day and we will uh, let you know when it's time to make your way back over after the workshops into the networking lounge and the Slack workspace. So enjoy the rest of the day.